Good morning, Illini. Welcome back. I'm Matt Schrock, your host here for Healthy Illini Podcast. And if you're new to the program, welcome. We're excited that you're here. If you're returning, you might notice that my voice is a little jacked up today. I am coming off uh, some illness and still trying to get my uh, voice back in shape. So I sound a little hoarse. So I do apologize, but we're going to muscle through on this one and see what we can uh, we can accomplish. Um, I'm excited about today's podcast. I say that all the time. I'm excited about the topic, but I am. I love the topics that we do. I, I, I enjoy them all. But today is one that I do. I wasn't very familiar with, um, to be honest. And so when I started looking into it, I, I'm I'm really encouraged by what it can, uh, what it means, and the implications it can have. And so uh, we got two guests today, and we're going to jump right into it because we got a lot to cover today. We are talking about intuitive eating, and um, so because of that, we are joined by Bree Witted. She is a return guest here. Uh, she is one of our dietitians here at McKinley Health Center. Bree, thanks for being back. You are welcome. And we're also joined by another return guest, actually. Uh, back in the fall of 22, we had the peers for McKinley. You had the peer groups on and a representative of each. And Brianna Mitris was here representing the nutrition peers. And she has been so gracious as to return again today. Brianna, thanks for coming back. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> as I said, we are uh, talking about intuitive eating. And for some, that might be a familiar phrase. I mean, it might be something that you've heard before. But for others like me, uh, it was a completely unknown concept. I had no idea what it was when it was presented as a possible uh, topic. And so uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this part because I do want to get to uh, talking about the actual principles of intuitive eating, what it means, how it uh, affects us. But um, as we uh, try and do on a lot of these topics, we want to start with a general overview. So uh, either one of you can jump into this, uh, but what is intuitive eating just as, as a basic idea? Yeah, Matt, I think a lot of people tend to like oversimplify the, the concept of it and they think like that it means just to eat when you're hungry, stop when you're full, which is is kind of like, like I said, an oversimplification of the concept. But really intuitive eating means giving up the diet mentality that we've all kind of been stuck in and requires us to listen to our body more and tap into our body's natural ability to tell when we're hungry, when we're full, when we're satisfied. And there's a lot of different components that kind of go into that. And you put in uh, one of the one of the pieces that we were doing, one of the things you said is basically it's freedom to eat, freedom to eat as much as you need um, to satisfy your body. And I like that freedom because a lot of times when we start talking about diet and nutrition, especially diets, um, it feels restrictive. Mm -hmm. It feels very... Um, almost cumbersome. Um, there's a there's a weight or expectation that comes with that, and so the idea that uh, that intuitive eating can be a freedom is a huge thing um, for a lot of people because we just don't have that relationship with food. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was I'm really excited to see how that fits into the the things that are coming. Um, but you did also mention in that prep that it's not necessarily a brand new approach. Um, but if you look at the scope of nutrition and history and things like that, it is a fairly new approach. So is this something that uh, is, is starting to gain acceptance, gain um, uh, prominence? Uh, it, what are the benefits of doing this? I don't know if uh, Brianna and your studies, because you're a student studying this kind of thing, is this something that's brought up or is this kind of uh, kind of like a new, we're still testing it and see how it works? Yeah, def the conversation on campus definitely is leaning or is open to this idea and this concept. Right now on with college students, they're really experiencing that restriction and dieting culture from their peers. And so some people are wanting that sense of freedom. And it is like an up and coming kind of trend where, you know, it's a, like a relief from all these restrictions that we place on ourselves. So it's very attractive to other people. And it allows you to enjoy your favorite foods without self-imposing guilt and feeling shame for having that enjoyment. And so once people start to practice these principles, they really start to fall in love with themselves and how they can enjoy life in a new way. And so for that reason and that genuine peace of mind it brings people, I think it's start definitely starting to become a mainstream topic. I, I was really impressed as, as I was reading the things that you presented uh, beforehand. I was kind of familiarizing myself so we could have this conversation. I was really impressed that a lot of the conversation about the benefits wasn't about being physically healthier or losing weight or any of those things. It was a very whole person approach that the benefits were you feel better about yourself, that you feel um, positive about your interactions with food, that you it relieves stress when it comes to food. And so it was much more than just checking the boxes of, because even like, uh, even, you know, eat the rainbow. 
that's a pretty common. But even then, you're like, okay, I have this color, and I have this color, and I have this color, and and it it still feels like a task in a lot of ways, which is not necessarily bad. Um, but as I was reading it, I didn't catch any of those kinds of things. It was very much almost an intuitive, just find what works for you kind of idea. Would that be correct? Mm -hmm. Well, I think so much of us kind of get caught up in like, it feels better to follow rules and have like guidelines. And this is kind of a concept that steps away from that a little bit. So when we're born, we have this innate ability to kind of like by our instincts, like, you know, it guides our intakes. But as we have developed, like, over the years, you know, by environmental encouragement or factors, it we kind of develop, you know, different ideas or in, influenced by different concepts. But really, like, we lose sight of the brain's ability to kind of interplay our instinct, emotion, and thought process. And I think part of that is not just in when we're talking nutrition, but anything. We as humans like rules because they're measurable. Um, you know, if how am I doing in my as a parent, let's say that can be really hard because I don't have a checklist. And if I don't have a checklist, how do I measure it? And so that when we come to food, we kind of do the same thing. Um, so you're right. We do like rules. But there's a there's a value in kind of stepping back from some of that sometimes. I do want to make one thing because I made a comment about the, the eat, eat the color, you know, eat the rainbow. Um this does not, and what you said, this does not eliminate other nutritional uh, instruction or other nutrition concepts. Uh, it's very important that, that I don't want it to come across as in, oh, forget everything you ever heard. Uh, those things don't matter. Uh, it's not that. It's finding a balance in that. Um, so let's jump into it um, because this campus is full of ideas and theories. That's what uh, college is about. You're learning all these things. But for me, if I hear a theory on something or someone has a like, well, hey, we need to do this, but they don't have any roadmap, actionable kind of idea how this actually functions, I'm less interested because, you know, I can tell you all kinds of great ideas, but if I don't have a path to get there, it's not going to matter. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about, you know, stepping away from some of those rules. We're talking about being some freedom in how we make decisions. There are 10 principles. What are those 10 principles that kind of help guide when you're trying to figure out how to incorporate it intuitive eating into your own life? Uh, yeah, so the first principle is really to acknowledge and reject the diet mentality. And we've really been talking about that this whole time, which is that element or that craving for rules and control. And so diets are exactly that. It's a checklist of things that you can do to then be healthy or be on track. And that sense of control is what gives us comfort. With intuitive eating, you really have to reject those rules and that ele those elements of restriction and just turn in into words and listen to yourself. And so starting with that principle can be very hard for a lot of people because first you have to acknowledge and see the diet culture around you. And most of us don't even know it exists. We're just living in it. And so that is like the first step is like seeing the diet culture around you and then learning to reject it and um, start to listen to yourself instead of someone else's rules. So that's the first step. And, and, and in talking, I know that you both said that it's not really a... A, then B, then C, then D kind of idea when you look at these 10 principles. Um, so that's going to influence everything else that comes along. And so as we're going through these 10 principles, it's, kind of, it, it's not easy to talk about because you, we like rules. We like this, then that, then this, then that. But uh, as we do it, you're going you're gonna to hear and you're going to notice that some of these have bleed over into other and they're going to be very similar to others. Um, but it does all start with that, that introspection and that idea of understanding what's around us and, and understand what, what influences us. Uh, which leads kind of to the second point um, as far as making these decisions. And the second principle that I want, want you to talk about a little bit is honor your hunger. Um, what does that mean? Yeah, so I think that a big thing with intuitive eating is just to learn how to be like more in tune with our biological and, you know, physiological needs, but then also to kind of like remove obstacles that lead us to being more in tune. So that's a lot of the concept. So um we really need to recognize how to like learn what being hungry feels like to us because a lot of times when we follow those rules we like eat based on these guidelines and we don't even pay attention to like when we actually are physiologically hungry so instead of like thinking from like the calorie counting standpoint like oh I'm not going to eat I'm going to save those calories for later we really want to learn how to like feel that hunger and actually feed ourselves thinking of it in more terms of like energy versus calories is kind of 
a big thing. Anything else, Brie? Yeah, and with this intuitive eating approach, as we mentioned before, it really takes in more than just food. It's the whole person. It's a holistic approach. And so when we are talking to college students on campus, many times college students are stressed. They have a lot on their plate. And so their attention to their body and their own emotions and like stress cues or triggers or even hunger cues often gets pushed to the side and to the back burner. And so when they don't feel hungry in the morning before their 8 a.m. and then all of a sudden they really just don't feel hungry for lunch either, that's them ignoring their hunger cues and training themselves to not recognize them. So after your freshman year of training yourself not to have breakfast, then of course breakfast will make you sick because you just haven't had it. And so it's really about rebuilding that trust with yourself and recognizing, okay, I know I'm stressed, but I also know I need fuel and energy right now. And that's really important for my studies. And so it's about rebuilding that trust with food and really incorporating um, just eating more and, you know, eating when you're hungry, but also stopping when you're full. And just that gentle nutrition approach of listen to yourself and fuel your body for success. And I know that's something that, like I said, I was reading, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, that's tough. Um, this is one that was tough because I'm, I, I have, over the years, I don't eat until I'm more than hungry. Like, I'm like, I have to eat, um, that kind of thing. And because I've just, that's just how I, I've rolled for so long. And that's not a good thing because then I, yeah, I fall into other traps because then I don't want to take too much from what you guys are saying. Uh, or speak. then you're more likely to overeat. That that was I was gonna say that's the other thing is then I'm more likely to binge or make bad ch- food choices because I might be somewhere where I don't have a healthy choice and so I just grab whatever's nearby. Um, and the worst thing for me possibly is shopping during that time um, because I will get <laughs> all the junk food that's there because because I'm just at that, that starving point. It also like relates back to like our primal sense of starving. Like if we're in a fight or flight, we're under stress, we're doing a work day, you know, eight or nine hours. You don't have the time to relax and let yourself be hungry. You're still in like, you're in the adrenaline. It's a long day. You know, you're running from a bear. You're not going to be hungry. You're going to want to conserve your food until you can relax and be done. And so with from your example, it's the same thing. It's like you trained yourself to be um, like, you know, hold on to the end of the day. You don't have time to eat and it's okay. But now that I can relax, I'm going to grab whatever's closest and fuel up because you need that fuel. And that leads to the, one of the other uh, principles that you had listed was respect your fullness. Um, because, you know, now you're like you said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fuel up. So I'm going to make sure because I don't know when the next time I'm going to eat because I don't know when I'm going to be hungry again. So I'm just going to overload exactly. and make sure. And, and that's not a good choice either. So um, what does it mean? What does it mean to respect your fullness? So one thing that just came to mind with you talking um, is my or like people's association with sweets. And um, so if you're someone who likes to enjoy sweets but you're from a household or environment where they were restricted growing up now you see them as a treat a once in a while thing and so once you do have them or you go to an event and there's a bunch of cookies out you want to go crazy you want to enjoy as much of that as you can because you don't know when you're going to see it again and so for me i've been practicing by eating ben and jerry's because that's a really important practice to do (laughs) and so i used to never have ice cream in my house because i know I, i eat it all as soon as it entered my door it's gone and so working with Ashley and Bree, she's like, Ashley was like, buy the ice cream, like see what happens. And so, yes, I do enjoy my life more. I eat a lot more Ben and Jerry's, but I can also stop. I can eat like a third of the pint or half the pint. And sometimes it's the whole thing. And you know what? No judgment because that's what this is about. But the fact that I can stop at a certain point and acknowledge that, okay, I'm full. I've had enough of this sweetness and there's going to be more the next day. That kind of takes away that all or none mentality. Which which does lead to another uh, principle, uh, making peace with food. Um, exactly. So, Bree, if you want to kind of jump back to that one, I'm jumping around a little bit, I know. Yeah. Um, but making peace with food, whoa, why is that so important? I think it really comes down to kind of like calling a truce and stopping that food fight. The more you tell yourself that a food is off limits, the more you're going to be driven to overeat that food when you actually have exposure to it. So if you tell yourself that you shouldn't or you can't or won't have a particular food, it leads to like more of those intense cravings, um, feelings of de- deprivation. Um, you know, oftentimes for some it leads to binging when you actually get around that food. So it's almost a, I'm not supposed to eat this, but now that I am, I'm going to go ahead and eat all of this. Yeah, but we really want to kind of stop viewing foods as good or bad. And that's kind of like what making making peace with food 
kind of is summarized as. It could literally be summarized as making peace with the plate in front of you. Like if I have not had lunch, but I'm getting offered a piece of pizza from my department and it's free and I know I can't eat till later in the night, I'm not going to reject that pizza because it's quote, not the healthiest option. If it's an option and it has carbohydrates, it has protein, maybe vegetables, but it depends on the pizza's life. Um, like, I'm not going to reject that and label that as an unhealthy bad food and then skip a meal. I'm going to trust and make peace with the plate, have the food. And if I'm still hungry after, I'm st- I might have seconds because even though it's pizza, it's still my body needing fuel. And that's me making peace what's in front of me. And you talk about the, you know, the idea of stop categorizing food as good or bad. Uh, that leads to another principle, which is challenging the food police. Um, so who are the food police? What are we talking about here? Brianna, I feel like you kind of speak to this one. Yeah, I mean, the food police are every are all around us. Um, the food police can be your mom. It can be um, your friends, your peers. Um, it can be people you follow on social media. It could be uh, fitness influencers you've never met in real life, but, you know, all your friends follow. And so these are people that kind of set the standard as to what has they've been told maybe previously in generations and that worked for them and so they're going to perpetuate it to the next people and so these people these influences have been around us our entire lives so now unfortunately the food police live in our brains as well and so everyone has an inner critic but now you have another inner critic that's judging the food you eat the choices you make and then how you feel and how much you should have and so a lot of the time when I was in high school and stuff, like I, it was understood that like females should not have more than 2000 calories a day, period. And that was something that I thought was true because that was like what people told me. And, um, and then the next step was, okay, now you need 1300 calories a day, 2000 is too much. And I was like, hold on, like, what the heck? And now as I've been in dietetics, I've learned that that's about this amount of calories a toddler might need per day. And for that to support a grown woman is just absolutely ridiculous and not true. Um, It's more detrimental. And so I would, but the food police told me that that was the right thing to do. Um, And so, you know, starting to learn more and acknowledging these influences that might not have all the facts and then really consulting professionals like dietitians to review those facts and kind of reorient you. um, That's where you start to be able to challenge them because you can, actually see both sides of it and then decide for yourself what's best. I think um, what you said, Brie, like the place in our brain. So I think of like a police station that houses all of these like bad, like the thoughts that are negative, like hopeless, like guilt provoking things like shame. I can't have carbs with dinner. um, I shouldn't have fat. Like anything that kind of creates that or is followed up by guilt. Those are the the police that we want to kind of chase away. And what is that guilt about? It's about the fear of becoming unhealthy or in our society, unhealthy is a very specific body type, which is usually people that are overweight. And as we are learning, like having extra weight on your body doesn't necessarily affect your overall health. Um, It's more to do with your diet, the types of food you're eating, your normal everyday activities. And so it's also rejecting that fear of society and what they tell you you should look like and what you should eat like um, and how to get there and so it's a lot to overcome but it's pretty amazing once you can see the other side of it we're about halfway through those 10 principles um just as a review the five we've talked about so far reject diet mentality honor your hunger make peace with food challenge the food police and respect your fullness the next one is one that I was very grateful to hear. I remember when I was first, I was a young parent and trying to figure out health and nutrition, all these things. And there was a real big push in certain circles I was in that you only, that food is fuel. That's all it is. You just, if you look at it as just fuel, it'll help you manage, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, but I like to eat. I, I like food. And it was a real battle in, in, in my uh, internally because I, I was like, well, I, I guess I'm supposed to look at this fuel, but I like eating some things. I like the flavors. I like variety. I like all these things. And um, that that kind of ties into the next one, uh, the next principle, which is discover the satisfaction factor. Mm-hmm. Um, but what does that mean for an individual? Because it, it, it has to be different for everybody, correct? Yeah, I think this is one that's looked, looked over a lot of times or looked past um, for people. Because in a like a fury to be thin or healthy or be a certain size, we often forget about pleasure and satisfaction. And that's a huge, very important part of eating. Um, 
I'll have students or clients come in a lot of times that, you know, like you can tell that they feel guilt or shame if they're like, well, but I had some sauce on there or, you know, I added dressing. Yes. And uh, I'm like, that's totally fine because that makes it taste better to you. And it'll salt. Yeah, it's not a bad thing. And if vegetables taste better with a little dip, then by all means, like if that's going to make you eat them, um, then go for it. But when we eat what we really want in an environment that is inviting and conducive, um, the pleasure just like increases of, of that particular food. So when we provoke these experiences and have this pleasant like environment around us, we can like decide maybe a little sooner that we've had enough because we we have that satisfaction part of it. Yeah. Um, and I'm from a family too where like we ate really fast, and so I'm so in this department or like through these experiences, I've had to really force myself to slow down and listen to my body. Um, you know, try to eat within. Not too fast, not too slow. And it sneeze. When you're in a rush or when you're not really in tune with your hunger cues, that satisfaction factor from food very rarely appears. You know, you might be in the dining hall, you have half an hour to eat lunch before your next class. You're not thinking about relaxing or how good this burger is or how crunchy the fries were or how tasty the ketchup was and how much you enjoyed it. You're thinking about fueling up and moving on. And so this is also about kind of taking that step back to like really savor the food in your mouth, be mindful about the meal and the people you're with and how you're enjoying it, and then really connect with those emotions of satisfaction. And, and it's interesting that you're now talking about how food makes you feel, not just how um, like what you're eating or um, you know kind of calories or or you're hungry. Now it's about the experience because the next couple principles really have less to do about food and more to do about who you are, if, I, if I've interpreted it correctly. Because um, for the next one, it, it, it's, it's honor your feelings without using food. So it's interesting to me that intuitive eating actually involves steps that that you're focused on things that are not food. Um, so so what is, what, how does that fit in uh, into this idea that you're trying to honor your feelings without using food? Well, I think we're all kind of guilty of sometimes trying to use food to replace maybe something else that's missing in our life or something that we're kind of craving. Um, so people use food to like comfort, nurture, distract, resolve other issues that are going on. <clears throat> Coping with issues too. Mm -hmm. So um, this might entail like, you know, anxiety, stress, loneliness, boredom, anger. These are all emotions that we experience um, throughout different parts of our life. And each one has a trigger that might need another cure besides just food. So I think kind of trying to really figure out what is your deep-rooted, you know, like cause or what you're searching for and finding ways that will resolve that problem not using food. That takes some that takes some serious intentionality because I know I'm a stress eater. I am. Um, I Whenever I get super stressed with whatever it may be, that's when I start having cravings of things, sweets, you know, whatever. Um, and so you have to have that moment of internal introspection to say, okay, this is why I'm feeling this way. This is why I'm craving these things. And that can be hard sometimes because not only are you having to look at why you're eating, but sometimes you have to confront really tough situations mm -hmm. that you're kind of masking with eating. Um, and so yeah, because for sure you're like, sometimes we use food and we eat too much of it and then we're physically full and maybe kind of like uncomfortably full but then we still have that issue to deal with so you're left uncomfortable for like multiple different reasons at that point which can then snowball mm -hmm. um, and what do we do when we feel uncomfortable we look for a quick fix and for a lot of people that can be food some people it might be other um other habits and i'm not calling you out but maybe you restrict some sweets and so that's why you're craving sweets as that quick fix when you are feeling stressed and one thing that we do know too about the brain is every time you eat, you get a release of dopamine. So if people who are practicing having one meal at the end of the night or only two meals a day, you're getting a huge rush of dopamine when you do sit down to eat that big meal all at once. Um, and so your brain's addicted to that. It likes that rush of dopamine, that relief of stress. And so that's a rush. And so by honoring your feelings without using food, you're training your body to respond 
without that quick fix and you're teaching yourself new coping skills to manage these problems that are more sustainable. And so when we are trying to ask you to respect your hunger cues and discover that satisfaction factor, hopefully you start to honor your feelings of hunger by eating, you know, three meals a day or snacking throughout the day. And that actually alters it. So you're having dopamine rushes each time, but it's not a massive overwhelming fix or a rush of relief. It's more of a um, more natural feeling of satisfaction and you're moving on with your day. And so by practicing that change in approach to food and also coping skills and incorporating new ones, first of all, you take the pressure and all those thoughts off the food because now you have other tools to work with. Um, and then you can also use food as that energy tool, but also enjoy it for what it is. And that that shift in mentality is tough. Um, and and uh, that leads us into the next one, which for me is probably the toughest one on this list. Um, to, to When it came up, I was like, oh, I don't want to talk about that. Um, but the idea, the principle is respect your body. Um, I think there are very few people in the world who do not have some sort of personal body issue. They look in the mirror. I mean, we're all our own worst critics. You know, the most beautiful person in the world, quote unquote, but based on standards or whatever, can look in the mirror and see flaws. Um, and so respecting your body it, is really tough. But why is why is that part of this intuitive eating? Why is respecting your body so important to have as part as a principle for this whole idea? Well, I think we have to learn that we we might not love how our body looks all the time um, or even how it feels all the time. But we have to have some realistic expectations of um, like that we can't feel like our body has betrayed us all the time. So um, maybe learning how to love your body might be like too big of a jump, like right out of the gate. But maybe taking steps towards trying to accept what our genetic blueprint might be. So I saw an example once that was like, you know, if you wear like a size eight shoe and the only thing available is like a size six, I've done this before. If this, if the shoe is so cute, I'm like, sure, bring me whatever size you have, but it's really uncomfortable to try to fit your foot into like a size six shoe. So I need to like accept the fact that my foot fits better and I feel better when I try to, um, put myself into a situation that that fits my size better yeah and it's also like it's never a straightforward process and that's why these are just guidelines um i'm still working through this every like everyone who's experienced that body dissatisfaction will experience that inner critic and you know it that's why you can't have a checklist for this it's really coming down to the person and you have to learn yourself you have to get to know your body, what you're good at, you know, what you love about your body or appreciate. Maybe a good hearing. Maybe your eyesight's really good. Maybe your feet don't smell. These are all great positive qualities. And so you have to respect that and not constantly bash yourself. You have to change the inner critic or the inner voice to appreciate your body rather than bash it. And we're not going to be able to reject that diet mentality if we can't accept, like, our genetic blueprint and what we were kind of made and predisposed to be like if you look around there's all kinds of different body shapes and sizes and um you know like I have two kids who are built very differently and so they're never gonna like be the same size um but they certainly can have qualities about them that they can love individually and if I were to follow like only fitness influencers on Instagram and that's the only bodies I see every single day I'm always going to feel like my body's not good enough because I'm not looking like them when I'm on campus and I open my eyes and look at the people walking on campus around me everyone's different they have body different body types different ages different heights weights it doesn't really matter because they're just getting from point a to point b and their body can take them there and that's the reality of it and so when you kind of remove yourself from that social media bubble or those the types of bodies you're looking at based on like I guess your own creation by accident um you can start to like reorient that mindset as as difficult as respect your body and honor your feelings about food can be as a principle the next one um actually is pretty easy most people listen and go oh yeah I know that one but you brought a different perspective to it um and that is exercise and movement um everybody's like oh yeah I know exercise that's a big part of it which it is exercise is important uh, being physically active is a huge key for health and wellness. Um, but there was something you talked about in the prep, um, which was uh, joyful. 
Mm-hmm. What is that? What is joyful movement? And is that slightly different than what exercise has been considered by, you know, traditionally by some people? Well, we know, like, by just basic science that movement has so many benefits for us, but it shouldn't be like a contractual relationship that we have with it. Like, we want to move away from like, militant exercise which is something that we like force ourselves to do very methodically um you know like on a routine like even when we feel like crap one day we you know we wake up and we still do it anyway um but you want to find exercise that makes a difference for you or like feels good to you so to shift your focus to how it feels to move your body rather than like the calories that you burned so joyful movement is basically movement we get to do not movement that we have to do so focusing more on how you feel from exercise such as like maybe feeling more energized stronger empowered capable um like brianna said in the last concept that we, we need to appreciate that our body can get us from point A to point B and and just be happy that it can move. So fly out of the ozone layer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think finding that what you described joyful movement is the things you get to do as opposed to what you have to do is important because it can be different for everybody. Because I know, Bree, you're a runner. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of your happy place. That is the opposite of a happy place for me. For my, <laughs> people are like, I've done it before. I've run before. I, I've done, you know, 5Ks. I'm doing another 5K in the, the spring. Um, I've done tough mutters and things like that. And everybody's like, oh, once you get into a few weeks, you'll love it. I hated every second of the running. Like, you know, there's certain things I enjoy. Running is not one of them. I, I, I appreciate, I appreciate the benefits, but I never got at a point where I was like, oh, this is, this is easy. I can do this. I mean, every step I was like, I hate this. And that's how I would feel with swimming. Like if someone told me to go swim, I like, that would just be misery for me. So, so that's important to understand in who you are that. I, I'm not going to enjoy this activity, so I'm going to stop doing this activity. I'm going to find something else that I actually do enjoy doing. Because like I, I said, I did, I've done a Tough mutter. I hated the the running, walking part of it. I love the obstacles. I love obstacles. I think they're uh, so much fun. And some people are like, I would hate that part of it. Um, so finding what works for you is really a, is really a key. Um, there's one more, and we're going long today, but that's okay because this is all this is important. And 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 I knew we would go long anyway. Um, but there was just too much here that was important to bring up. But the last one, the last principle, um, is really kind of almost an all encompassing for the others. Um, but it's honor your health with gentle nutrition and, um, gentle nutrition, I think is a great way to describe it because in the, in respect your body and in, in some of the others, you really talked about being kind to yourself. Um, and is that what, is that basically how you would describe gentle nutrition is just being kind to yourself and what you're, what you're choosing? Yeah, I think it's basically just um, finding a way to honor your health and show your body respect and affection. So I think we've kind of touched on a lot of this, like you said, like in other principles throughout. Um, But just remember that your diet doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to eat perfect all the time to be healthy. Um, We aren't going to like develop a vitamin deficiency or gain weight um, just from one one snack or one meal or one day where we maybe, um, you know, didn't eat as balanced. So it's basically kind of getting back to the concept of um, what you eat consistently over time that matters and focusing on progress, not perfection is really what counts. So we've gone through the 10 principles and if you're listening, that's a lot of information. (laughs) It's It's a lot to process. Uh, I've run a number of times. I've gone through the prep work, and it's still a lot for me. It can feel overwhelming. Um, but fortunately, if you're listening and you're a student at UIUC, uh, you have a great resource. On, you have a couple great resources on campus. So before we go, I want to. If somebody had more questions, if they want to know more, they wanted some assistance in this idea, they wanted just you know to to follow up with it. What are the resources that you both have available that that could help them with it? Um. So. Like you mentioned, and we've maybe mentioned in other podcasts, we have two dietitians here at McKinley that students have access to, and you can make an appointment and we can talk through it, you know, in multiple sessions and how to incorporate these steps and practices into your life. This is a lot of times what we spend time in our sessions discussing with students, like processes that they have around food to help them identify what thoughts may be distorted or unhealthy. Really, we want to make it their relationship with food just feel less stressful. So that's ultimately a lot of the conversations that come up in our 
We also want to make sure that we are surrounding ourselves with positive messages. So um, we're not the only dietitians in the world. We aren't the two that developed this, but um, there's a lot of other dietitians that are trained and well-versed in this, and they send similar messages on their social media. So make sure that you're always following like positive social media accounts. And with that, Brie. And we also have, um, as part of our nutrition education department, we do have the Nutrition Peers, which is a peer-run group led by our dietitians to kind of talk about diet culture and this mentality on campus. So if you're interested and you're on Instagram, please follow UIUC Nutrition Peers. Um, you can also request workshops for your RSO classes um, or you just want to have a workshop with cooking. Um, we're happy to do presentations, invited speaking, and cooking demos. So we just want to be involved on campus with you guys. And as always, you can find links and, and information on those resources in the bio of this episode. So be sure to check that out. Guys, I, I really appreciate it. We went long, I know, but you had so much good information in there. I didn't want to cut you short. Um, but I really appreciate you both uh, taking the time today to come and talk to me about it. I, uh, so thank you so much. You're welcome. This is never the intended to be the end all conversation. It's always the intended to be the start of the conversation. And so if you've been listening, you've heard these 10 principles, whether it be reject diet mentality, honor your hunger, make peace with food, challenge the food police, respect your fullness, discover the satisfaction factor, honor your feelings without using food, respect your body, exercise and movement, or honor your health with gentle nutrition. Any of those um, have resonated with you or you have more questions, I really encourage you to reach out um, because they are uh, in-depth conversations and they are conversations that are particular to you. Uh, we talk a lot on this program about everyone has commonalities. And for instance, we have 50,000 students that are here at UIUC, but of those 50,000, while they're all UIUC students, they all have individual journeys in that time. And so, um, so I really encourage you to reach out, talk to somebody, find out how these principles work for you, find out how they uh, interact with where you're at and where you want to go. And, you know, if you have questions, if you have comments, you want to hear more about it, you want to interact with us, please reach out to us here at Healthy Alina. I'm always uh, excited to talk to somebody about the things that we cover, um, have opportunity to dive deeper into it and uh, just uh, create relationships. But thank you for joining us today. You're on a personal journey no matter where you are in it. You are important and you matter. Your health and wellness are important and matter, and we are here to keep you well to excel. So go have a great week, Illini. Let us know how you're doing, and we'll catch you next time on Healthy Illini.